Uh, Professor Schwartzchild is the du uh, Director of Creative Writing in the English Department here at UAlbany and a longtime fellow of the New York State Writers Institute. An acclaimed author, his books include Insecurity, Responsible Men, and The Family Diamond. He's also the front man of the alt folk roots rock band, Dr. Baker. He heaps the flame of creative writing alive here at UAlbany. Please welcome Ed Schwartzchild. All right, thank you, and thank you, Mark. Uh, let's, uh, let's keep the applause going. This, this 40th anniversary year of the New York State Writers Institute has been phenomenal. What a season to the New York State Writers Institute. Thank you, guys. Talk about the, the flame of creativity. Uh, it, it, just, it just is always coming through the Institute. Uh, and burning bright. Last, we were supposed to have this event, uh, I don't know, back in February, uh, but, but there was snow came, and so Peter, we, we just had, uh, we couldn't do it, and, and I'm just so glad we were able to reschedule. It got cold again today, cloudy, uh, but not snowing, thank goodness. And so I, I just want to say a few words about Peter. This is, you know, as you know, these are informal uh, afternoon events where we're, we're mainly focused on discussion, so I will keep the... Uh, the introduction brief, and then, and then Peter's going to read a few uh, pieces of fiction and some of the essays from the new book, and then we'll just have a, a Q&A. Uh, I'll start it, and, and, uh, and then we'll open it up to the floor. But I, I just want to say a few words about what a pleasure it is to have Peter Orner here with us today. Peter is one of those writers I've revered ever since I started reading his work, uh, you know, years and years ago. And uh, I am not alone, uh, to, to borrow a phrase, I'm not alone here in this. Uh, here's Dwight Garner writing in the New York Times. He said, it's been apparent since his first book, Esther Stories, that Peter Orner was a major talent. He's a writer's writer. He's been compared with cause to short story eminences ranging from Alice Munro to Raymond Carver, to Dennis Johnson. Orner writes frequently about blue collar men and women in lives that didn't quite pan out. His people stand around in motel parking lots, they crash in cheap rental units. His exacting prose casts an elegiac and autumnal glow. You know from the second you pick him up that he's the real deal. His sentences are lit from below like a swimming pool with a kind of resonant yearning that's impossible to fake. Uh, that's from the New York Times. I'll give, and, and then the New York Times writes about Peter often, and Peter sometimes writes for the New York Times. Uh, and recently, for the, for the newest book, uh, he, uh, the, the reviewer Stephanie Greist, I think I'm pronouncing that right, uh, wrote that Orner's writing in fiction and nonfiction is an act of wizardry. He reduces the meat of his own life down to the bone, then stirs in fatty excerpts from hundreds of stories, novels, and poems by writers ranging from Wolf to Reese, Bobble to Kafka. The resulting brew sometimes scalds, sometimes soothes, but always proves that literature can be a kind of sustenance. Uh, over the years, Orner has published prize-winning novels and story collections, and he's edited extraordinary works of uh, oral history. He's been nominated for and or won too many awards to mention, but I'll name drop just a few. Uh, Pushcart Prizes Multiple, uh, the Rome Prize from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Fulbright Scholarship, and more. He's currently a professor and chair, he chose to be chair, of the uh, uh, English department at Dartmouth College. We could ask him about that, how he's feeling about that decision uh, these days. Uh, but he is the chair of the English department at Dartmouth. Uh, and just, just a little bit more, uh, the first section of his first book uh, called Esther Stories, I have it up there, it's the one that, that, that Dwight Garner just mentioned. The very first section of that book has, as he often does, it has its own title, right? They're, the books are often divided up into sections. And the first section of Esther Stories is called what remains. Uh, it's almost as if from the very beginning of his writing career, Peter was telling us that he had a list to share. A list of all the things and feelings and sights and sounds and events and words and stories and more that endure, that last, that remain. At the same time, it's almost as if from the very beginning, Peter has been posing a question that won't stop haunting him. At the end of the day, what remains? Does anything remain? Or as he puts it in his latest book, uh, there's, there's one, one of the many things you could, I could quote from this book, uh, that once, if you read the book, you'll find yourself quoting from it. You'll find yourself 
trying to gather up, as one of uh, the students in class today was talking about, gathering up all the references and trying to make sense of everything that he's read so that then you can go read it uh, yourselves. But uh, the question, the, the sort of version of what remains, one of the versions that comes up in the latest book is, how can something so alive be so gone? How many ways to ask this? I can't wait to talk about these questions and whatever other questions remain or arise this afternoon. Uh, please join me in welcoming Peter Orner back to the New York State Writers Institute. And, and you can choose where you want to read. There you go. There? Yeah. Is that yeah. right? And then I'll join you up there once, oh, oh, you're, okay. once you read. I'll... How's that? I'm going I'm to stand here. Is that okay? Yep. I just need to pin this to you. Um, oh, Keep this that... to your jacket. This is for the camera. Sure. And then you can use that. That means I can't dramatically take my coat off. <laughs> you can't. Planning on doing. Um, okay. <laughs> this is for the room. This is, oh. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ed. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jen. Um, so nice to be here, to be back here. Um, it's been a long time since I was here, but um, I was thrilled to be asked, and, and I'm so glad that we were able to, to um, reschedule. And thank you, uh, Ed, for the incredibly generous words. Um, you know how I feel about you as a writer, um, and so it means a great deal to me to hear that, and so thank you. I'll try and live up to even a tiny bit of what Ed said. And I thought what I'd do is read one tiny little story, the first story in a book um, that came out a few years ago called Maggie Brown and Others. And I thought I'd just read the first story. Um, it's about something I saw, as uh, often my stories are, that haunted me for years, and then I tried to work with it. It's called The Deer. When she was a kid, she watched a mountain lion chase a deer into the lagoon at low tide. She'd been riding her bike on the path along the edge of Murch's farm. The deer ran out so far into the water that the mountain lion turned back to the shore and vanished into the trees. An hour later, the deer was still stuck in the mud. The tide began to roll back in through the channel connecting the lagoon to open water. She was only a kid, but as she watched the deer out there alone, she knew almost right away that this was something she'd carry the rest of her life. Later, she heard that a tourist seeing the deer in the lagoon from Highway 1 had called the fire department and begged them to do something. The assistant chief said, what do you want me to do about it? Go out there with a boat and get kicked in the head? Call the DNR. The lagoon, the waves, the motionless deer. It made no sound, or at least none that she could hear from where she was sitting as it waited, or seemed to wait, while the water rose covering its legs and then rising higher. She'd sat on a wet log and watched. The damp seeped through her pants. The wind began to blow inland from the ocean. No, it wasn't really happening. Even then, it was more like an image, fixed, not a breathing deer out there in the water. So much of what she remembers became lodged this way. Something occurs in the motion of the present, but it's already over. Because even then, even as she watched, she was already moving away from it, already thinking about how years from now she might tell someone about this, someone who's never seen this lagoon. The wind began to blow harder. The sun had long since fallen, but there was some light left. When she couldn't watch anymore, when she picked up her bike off the ground and rode away, the water had reached Deer's chest, and still it had not moved. So that's a, a tiny little thank you. Because um, it's been a while now. I, I don't like to, you know, fiction, you want it just to live and not have context. And, you know, I hope that, I, I think, you know, I hope that stories, I kind of live by this idea that stories don't need context. So the fact that I, something I based on something I saw isn't really relevant. But I will say, because it's been a while, I tried to imagine my daughter seeing what I had seen. And so that's her. In that, in that scene, remembering it. But um, it's actually something we saw together while driving. And uh, then someone did actually call the fire department. And then, it's not in the story, but some guy went out there on a surfboard and tried to rescue the deer, which of course didn't go well. Hence the kick. He survived. The deer, well, the deer. 
And um, so now I'm going to read a, 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 a brief essay um, from this new book. And uh, I won't set it up, I'll just read it. Um, except to say that uh, this new book is about um, true stories. And I thought when I was telling true stories that I wanted to also tell stories about what I was reading because I'm often telling stories about what I'm reading to myself. So I thought I might try them as essays. So that's what this is. Ford Maddox Ford once tried to tell Gene Reese to add more description, and, and because there's writers in the room, I thought I'd try this. Let's try that again. <laughs> Ford Maddox Ford, which is a great name for a writer, once tried to tell Jean Reese to add more descriptive passages to her stories. The word that Ford used was topography. A reader, he told Reese, needs to know where he's standing. Your stories are too skeletal, Ford said. They're like you, Jean. Not enough meat on their bones. Ford, Maddox Ford, was the first editor to see something in Jean Reese's work. He knew it was like nobody else's, and like most men at the time, like a lot of men at any time, he felt entitled to mold the work into his own image. He wanted more meat. Yet, Reese liked Ford. For a while, she liked him a lot. He was older, she was in her 30s, he was in his 50s, and common law married to someone else. But the two, and sometimes the three, since the story goes the wife was actually sometimes included, were lovers for a while in Paris in the 20s. But sex and conversation and books and good wine were one thing, Jean Reese's work another. And she went through her stories and hacked every extraneous and not so extraneous description she could find. Fuck topography. I'm talking here about Reese's early stories, those collected in her first book, The Left Bank, published in 1927, with a length, lengthy preface by Ford. Ford rattles on mostly about himself for 15 pages, before mentioning Jean Reese and managing to say this. One likes, to, in short, to be connected with something good. And Miss Reese's work seems to me so very good, so vivid, so extraordinarily distinguished by the rendering of passion and so true that I wish to be connected with it. Left Bank was followed by four novels, the last of which, Good Morning Midnight, came out in 1939. And then, the story goes, Jean Reese vanished, not only from the literary scene, but she seemed to drop off the math, map itself. Vienne, the last story in the left bank, might be the best of what I think of as her slash and burn period. At 29 pages, Vienne reads as if it's weightless. The narrator, Francis, laments that nothing much is left of the days she and her husband, Pierre, lived high on the hog in Vienna. All that remains are scattered images that loiter in her mind, mostly of people on the fringe. Vivid images of people she hardly knew, such as a petite Hungarian dancer, a girl who could jump six feet and land on a wooden floor without a sound. And this is Reese. I saw people differently afterwards, because for once I'd met sheer loveliness with a flame inside. For there was it, the spark, the flame in her dancing. It is short-lived. The grateful dancer returns home. The graceful dancer returns home to Budapest. Later, Francis hears about her. News that Jean Reese, the writer, reduces to five words. Married to a barber. Rum. Vienne is oddly spare and lush at the same time. Reese often repeats words, doubles back for emphasis. At first, the husband, Pierre, is an ostentatious, ostentatious success. Money is pouring in from every direction. What Pierre does do to make, what does he do to make all that money? Is he on the up and up? Who cares? Francis doesn't give a damn so long as the money keeps coming. Nice to have lots of money. Nice, nice. Goody to have a car, a chauffeur, rings, and as many frocks as I liked. Good to have money. Money. All the flowers I wanted, all the compliments I wanted, everything, everything. Oh, great God, money. I get woozy. Start to feel I'm strutting around a casino in Vienna after the First World War, blissful drunk, tuxedo pockets bulging with cash. But nothing, not a thing lasts. 
again and again with merciless concision. Jean Rhys destroys her people. Her men, yes, but also especially her women. Typists, secretaries, shop assistants. Soon after they've tasted a little of the good life, Rhys cuts them down. Frances describes eating in a restaurant where at the very table she's sitting only a week earlier, another girl, a pretty Russian girl, newly pregnant, had shot herself. And here's the re sentence. With her last money, she had a decent meal and then bang, out. Reese refuses to dwell on the miserable facts that preceded this suicide, facts she knew well enough not to pretend they were unique. This Russian girl flickers as briefly as the Hungarian dancer, and we're left to imagine the gory scene at the table without the sort of descriptive lard that Ford was calling for, which for me makes it a hell of a lot more terrifying. And this is the end of it. I'm cutting to the end. Reese didn't vanish. She didn't disappear. Being broke and drunk and out of print does not mean you don't exist. We know a lot about where she was and what she was doing before she resur resurfaced. Her husband went to prison. Her second husband died. Her third, like the first, ended up locked up. We know that Reese was constantly hard up and moving from town to town. Her mental health always tenuous, her drinking nonstop. At one point, she went to jail herself for throwing a brick through her neighbor's window. At least she had a sound reason. The neighbor's cat, I'm sorry, the neighbor's dog had murdered her cat. And in spite of it all, Reese kept working, trying to work, not working, starting to work. And the stories told on book jackets, how she arose, one leg already in the grave, in 1966 with the typed manuscript of Wide Saragasso Sea in her gaunt hands, her masterpiece, the great Caribbean novel of her, of her girlhood. It makes for good myth, but the truth is not so clean. She was very much flesh and blood, and like everybody else, consumed by gnawing needs. In 1979, the year she died, Reese told the Paris Review, one day in the snow I felt so tired, I thought, damn it, I'll sit down, I can't go on. I'm tired of living here in the snow and ice. So I sat down on the ground, but it was cold, so I got up. I'm going to read a piece about Muhammad Ali, but maybe I'll do it later. Let's talk. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Do we hold this still? Yes. Okay. That's Got for it. the room. Got it. You, I always have to hold that. <laughs> oh, man, Peter, it's great to hear. It's so great to hear you read. It's such a treat. Thank you. We've been, as a class, we've been reading your work. Uh, and it's been a real pleasure. It's something we, we've been talking about. It's been all it's something. It's a voice that we've had with us the whole semester, which has been great. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start with just a couple of questions, and then I know others have questions, so I don't want to monopolize. Uh, can we start by talking about your, I guess, your path to this kind of writing, if there is a path to the kind of writing you do? Uh, and what I mean by that is in, in works like uh, still no word from you, or am I alone here, or, or, or your story collections, or your novels. One could say, uh, as, as you say in the new book, that essentially it is by gathering fragments, fragments of the stories that are told to us, or, or the stories that we tell, that by gathering these fragments, that's kind of the only, only real honest way to construct an, act, to construct an actual life on the page. Right, uh, I, mean, that, that, I think that, that's close to a quote of, 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 of the new book. Uh, and so my, my question is, when did, you, when did you realize that? How did you realize that? When did this commitment to gathering fragments in this way sort of appear in your, in your life? Is that too big a question? No, I mean, it's a great question. I wish I could answer it, you know? <laughs> uh, and at first of all, I want to say I'm honored that you guys have been spending time with my work, and that, you know, that's, that's all we can ask, right? And uh, things I say are probably um, going to be less, you know, I hope the work is better than what I say, let's put it that way. But um, I've always, I, I don't know, I can't really pinpoint when it started. I mean, I think I, I, I remember some of my early stories were kind of, um, you know, I was very influenced by John Irving. 
I like that kind of, I like that expansive storytelling and I, I, um, I tried to do that, you know? And I, it just, I think some of those early stories were, A, they were derivative, and B, they, they didn't excite me. Like there's something about, um, especially poetry, that when I, we just, I, I want that, I want to kind of grip this sort of intensity um, and, I, and I sometimes am impatient, I don't want to wait for it. <laughs> and I think that might be part of it. Um, that I just, that I want, uh, you know, and, and, and I mean, I do believe, and this is something that um, my great teacher and friend, Andre Debuse, said in an essay, that, 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 that as much as I love longer stories, and I try and write them myself, and I, I, I love to read novels like yours, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, always, I'm, I'm drawn to this idea that, that the, I'm drawn to the idea of the, the criticism, and I'll shut up, a criticism of short story collections, and you know this well, is people, I don't want to stop and start. I don't want to stop and start. That's not what I want. I don't want to stop and start. <laughs> right? And, you know, to me, that is what life is. <laughs> it is a bunch of stopping and starting. And so maybe story collections are too real for a lot of people. You know, and, 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 and so um, I've always sort of been drawn to that idea of, 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 of wanting to, to, to start again, you know. And, and, and then when you write a novel, do you feel, I mean, that, is it, I mean, when you, when you wrote your first novel and, and had to figure out the structure for it, uh, how, how, did that, how did that happen? Did you decide up front, well, this is what, this is what I do, and I'm going to stick to it, or did the was there no other way to do it, or how how did that happen? I don't know about you, but I, I when I'm when I'm working on a novel, and I'm, I shouldn't knock on something, um, yeah, paper. Uh, uh, it's 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 usually because the characters in in a story want to keep telling me stuff, you know, and so. And, and, and then, you know, it's still that stopping and starting thing because my novels are still a lot of, you know, a lot of moving around, a lot of moving pieces. And I like the mosaic structure. What they, there's like words for this now in creative writing language, which I'd never heard of, but I think there are words like that now that, that describe this. But I think when I was starting to do this, I don't think there was, even though the books existed, of course, they always have. Mosaic storytelling has existed since, you know, since Homer and since the Bible. I mean, it's, there's always that kind of stopping and starting and pieces, puzzle pieces together. But I think uh, when, it, when, I, when I am writing a novel, it's because I've, I've, I've got, I, I want to spend longer time with these people. Um, and to a certain extent, it's, it's when I write a story, I, I want that too, but I am also I also want to feel bereft, you know, and and so I want I want it all all the ways, you know. I want to feel bereft in a novel too. I want a novel to read as tightly as a story collection, yeah, well, that makes sense. or a story itself. Let's yeah. say. Yeah. Um, here's another kind of a broad question, right? Uh, kind of about I guess about travel and return a little bit. Uh, I mean, I think it wouldn't be difficult for people who read your work to get the sense that travel is almost like oxygen for you, that, that uh, there is inspiration for you in being elsewhere, uh, in being somewhere new. That, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to travel to, uh, you know, a, a tourist destination or an exotic location. I mean, for you, it could be, it could be anywhere that you stop and think about where you are, like a, a hospital, cafeteria, dorm room, swimming pool, what have you. Uh, but at the same time, as, as much as there's this travel in your work and this, this sort of commitment, devotion, obsession with elsewhere, uh, there's also Fall River, right? There's, I mean, it's like you're, you're drawn again from the, from the first book to the current book. You're drawn again and again uh, to Fall River. There's always more to find uh, in, in Fall River. And I, I wondered if you could talk about that, that sort of I don't know what I don't know what to call it, the, the, the travel and, and the return and how it influences your practice and your writing. Sure. I mean I was just thinking about the Dunkin' Donuts that I stopped in about <laughs> an hour ago. <laughs> and there's this guy who's I, I was 
you know, kind of changing my shirt in the parking lot, which maybe was a little weird. This guy was looking out the window at me, and he's just like, what is going, and I wasn't like naked or anything, you know, I was just changing my shirt, but um, uh, he was staring at me, and I had this like thing, like, oh, that, that's, we just had a thing, he and I, <laughs> something. Anyway, um, he looked lonely, actually. He looked like he was waiting for something to, something happened and and I gave him a tiny bit of something <laughs> but anyway um, um, but so you know I like to I like to I like those kinds of places you know and, and I know you do feel this way too I mean, we get a lot of our I mean I get a lot of my stories just by moving a little bit out of my universe you know and 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 that's why I um, I even I do a lot of traveling where I live <laughs> you know I, I make a point to go to places I haven't been even you know five minutes from my house and and so I, I've always done that and when I do travel and I, I, I do a, a fair bit um, and I like I, I like to be in a place for a long time you know and, and try to pretend I'm a I'm, pretend I'm a local I love to do that um, but there are certain touchstone places for me and places really important in what I do and I always return like you say to certain locations and um, one of them is definitely um, uh, Fall River, Massachusetts, where my mother was born and raised, and my grandfather had a furniture store, um, which um, he loved. He loved being a furniture store owner, and uh, it was his father's store before him. It was called Kaplan's Furniture. It was a pretty big place, about four stores, and a you know, massive kind of local furniture store. And uh, it was um, taken by the government in order to build I-195, which um, they wanted to connect Providence, Rhode Island to Cape Cod. They wanted to fa you know, get to the Cape faster you know, um, for the people in Providence. And they put a highway right through the heart of Fall River, thinking, and I've written the, this like 20 times, thinking that the highway, a four, you know, eight lane highway, was gonna bring business to Fall River. And my grandfather, at a hearing, stood up and said, you know, I just, I'm thinking, like, people are going to drive right by Fall River. Do you all realize that? And they're like, no, 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 this is going to be great. This is going to be fantastic. And, of course, you know, he was right. He wasn't a very aggressive guy, and he was a, somebody who wasn't making a lot of trouble. Um, he just kind of said that, you know, kind of casually almost. And, you know, he mourned that story his whole life, but he wasn't, like, bitter. He wasn't that kind of person. But... Anyway, I, I've always been drawn to him in particular and my grandmother, who were, um, you know, people who, they just sort of, um, they kind of endured that experience. Uh, their kind of livelihood taken away from them, and then they had the rest of their lives to sort of, you know, kind of have to live and, and have to pay the bills, and that was not easy. And I've always been drawn to their story, and I would spend summers there. You know, it was a, my my life in Chicago was different. My father was an attorney, you know, pretty well off. I lived in a you know pretty well off suburb, but I'd, every summer I'd go to Fall River, and I'd be in my grandparents' little house, you know, and sweating to death because it's so hot in Fall River. And I thought this is this is more I'm more comfortable here in some ways. So I think I've always tried to reach back to that time. Again, I'm long-winded today, I'm sorry. Oh, this is, I mean, people aren't here to hear me. I'm just asking questions. We want to hear you talk. This is great. Uh, I'll ask one more, and then I'm going to open it up. Uh, so be, be forewarned. This is my last question. Everybody else has to step up after this. Uh, so I, I, was, I was hoping we could talk just a little bit about the, the mix of work you do, right? And you, you mentioned the, the, the novels. Uh, we talked about the short stories. You, you read from a short, you read a short story. You read one of the essays. Uh, you also have done, you know, the, the the work with Voice of Witness and the, the sort of editing of oral history, uh, and compiling and editing oral history. You you do volunteer fire work. Uh, you uh, chair an academic department. You you teach. Um, so, and, and I'm sure there are many things I'm not even listing here that you do. Uh, but I, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how that either, how these different things feed each other, how they cannibalize each other, what kind, maybe they have, how they coexist in a way that is hopefully, you know, in, uh, constructive rather than destructive, but anything you would like to say. <laughs> it's both of those things. <laughs> you know, I, I feel like lately, especially, I feel a little bit, um, you know, that my, my, I'm, t I'm, I'm, pulled in too many different directions but I like uh, you know I, I kind of like to collect experience 
you know, and so if, if there's something I haven't done, I'll, I'll try it, you know, and, and that I think has always sort of helped my, my work. I'm, I'm always at the back in my mind thinking about that. Maybe it's the mercenary writer in me, as you, as you, as you of all people know well. Not that you, you know, joined the TSA just to write a story. I think you didn't. I mean, that's, would that, is that fair to say? Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely both complicated. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and that, I think, informed that novel, and, 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 you know, and so I think you, you throw yourself in situations as a writer and that's gonna complicate rather than, um, you know, and it will stretch, of course, and so it's always that, that balance, but I, I'd rather um, try new stuff than, than hide away. And I find when I do hide away, even though I love the time, um, I, I think I, I don't have that torque of an engagement. So I am a, um, a very rookie, and I've been a rookie for <laughs> five, I've been a rookie for uh, 11 years. Uh, I've been a rookie firefighter for 11 years. And uh, <laughs> my, I have very forgiving chiefs. Uh, you know, volunteer firefighters, they need you. If, if you live in a town with a volunteer, they'll, they'll take you. They'll take anybody. And, you know, I, I carry shovels. I, I sweep uh, the highway when, it's, um, when there's an accident. I'm very good at that. I sweep the glass off the, off the road. Um, but, you know, I, I get to talk to people, and I get to be in places where I, you know, I wouldn't in my day job um, as, a, as a college professor and so um, I really enjoy I, I enjoy not being myself you know and so I'll put myself in situations where where I can't be you know they know who I what I do and and my department has a bunch of people who are you know who, are, who actually do similar things that I do so it isn't so unusual but there's lots of guys that aren't I mean one of my closest friends in the department you know um, uh, a guy I really enjoy when he's in, when he's able to be at trainings is a prison guard you know and somebody you know and I'm always talking to him about, um, he actually is really wonderful on, on the history of our town because he's from there. Um, so anyway, just I love, to, I love to put myself in those kinds of situations. That's great, that makes, that makes so much sense. Uh, all right, uh, let's turn it over to the audience who's been patiently waiting uh, with questions for, for Peter. So anything you'd like to ask or, or uh, those of you who read the book or, or anything along those lines? Should I, I, can, I can. Should I just move over? Hi. Um, throughout reading the novel, like there is a lot of play with um, narrative and like perspective. So, can you give um, more feedback on why is it purposeful? Like, you know, you make a lot of um, quotes to either different poems or different. Um, moments and then there's like an introspection of you personally like I know on like chapter 11 it was like you mentioning a poem and you were like is it this way or is it that way so how important would you feel that it's like you know kind of intertwining your own voice when you're kind of working with this distant and like you know this disjointed kind of way to write these fragments of stories. Thank you thanks for the question uh, you know I, I it comes to like a little bit of what I was saying, just about collecting things, and and this book in particular was really all about that. Um, I find that when I do turn to nonfiction, it's usually because the, I'm having a little trouble imagining stuff. You know, my I feel like my job as a as a fiction writer to imagine things that uh, are remote m removed from me, even if it is you know I. Even if I'm writing about things I know really well, I still kind of try to make it an out-of-body experience. But in this book, um, uh, uh, still no word. I I was really consciously tracking the things that were on my mind, and so every day, uh, different things would be on my mind, and so they just started to kind of collect. And this you mentioned chapter 11. I had to check, but. Um, this is a Robert Haas poem. It's actually I don't name the poem. I don't name the poem just because it the title. I don't know, threw, it threw off the essay, but the title is My Mother's Nipples. That's the, actually the title of the poem. It's a beautiful and incredibly powerful Robert Haas poem. And in the poem, um, a little boy, presumably the, spe you know, the, you know, the poet, but I don't know for sure, uh, his mother's got a drinking problem and she's not home when he gets home. And he, he realizes, she, oh, she must be at the park. And she's asleep, at the, she's passed out in the park. And the kid, um, the kid, uh, goes to the park and sits by her 
and he pretends that his mom's just sleeping in the sun if people walk by. And I, I was so struck by that, just that. And it's a tiny little piece of the poem. And it just haunted me for days. You know, I was like, all right, I want to, you know, I mean, I guess the most honoring response might be just to read it and love it, right? But then sometimes you can't help but want to speak to it. And I think that's what I was trying to do. I was just trying to um, speak to that moment in a particular poem. And, um, you know, and that was it. That was all. And that poem, I mean, I, you could write 800 pages about the, the trajectory of that particular poem. It was that moment, though. Maybe it's because I knew it. I knew it. I knew that kind of moment. So. Uh, you mentioned earlier in your talk uh, that you enjoy putting stops and starts, and mm -hmm. that's why you're particularly drawn to um, nonfiction collections versus like a long story. Um, and I was just wondering, along the lines of stops and starts, within Still No Word From You, did you ever feel like pressure to try and uh, connect it into some kind of narrative flow? Or did you really just love like having these vignettes with related themes? The answer is yes and yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> I always feel that pressure, you know? It's natural to want things to connect, right? Um, but it also feels unnatural for me to force it. And, and I've always been pretty stubborn about that. To my detriment, <laughs> you know, I, I um, um, there's a novella in, in Maggie Brown that uh, takes place in Fall River that, you know, in some ways could be its own book. It really it could be. And I, I, I deliberately didn't want it to be. I wanted to be associated, those Fall River stories, with all the other things I think about and all the other stories I write. And I, I, something about, that I appreciate about, dis, about disunity, <laughs> in a way, because I, I think that sometimes the way we unify is too false. And that uh, my ultimate vision, though, was that these do go together. They just go together a, a little less intuitively than, than one narrative arc, you know. Um, I'm not the same reader, like, tomorrow and the next day as I was last week. And so I could have made it like the same person reading these stories, right? But I, I'm, t you know, I've got something going on in my life and I'm reading and then it affects me in a totally different way. I've had a death in the family and I, I, what I read, totally different way. So I can't be the same reader. So that in some ways, that was part of it. Like I'm, you know, as, as different as I want to be as a writer, I also want to be a different kind of reader because I just feel like that's the truth. Absolutely. Thank you, so much. Thank you. Thanks for that question. By the way. Just a, a, a quick, I don't need the mic for it, just a, a quick follow-up. I mean, did you feel that this, this book became a pandemic book in some ways? I mean, I think that seems like one of the things that may have emerged. I don't know how central that was to the, the process. It was. I mean, it's almost like a trope now, like a pandemic book. So I, I worry a little bit about that, you know what I mean? But, but it was definitely written in those weird days when suddenly we, I did have, as, as we all know, had a little more time to think, you know? And uh, I think um, it, it felt right. I mean, in some ways that, that felt the right thing, which I know a lot of people experience, so. Um, but, but in some ways, um, I wanted to write against that idea too. You know what I mean? That, that, that like, this should be what I, I should always be thinking this intensely about what I'm reading, you know? So. Yeah, but definitely I was, I was, I work in this weird hotel in uh, White River Junction, Vermont, and uh, I'd go, I'd go there every day, even though, so we were on, still on lockdown, you couldn't go. The governor said, you know, it's not like I was an essential worker at all, right? I mean, there's nothing essential about what I do, right? But I would, I would go and ride my bike to the, uh, to my, to it, the hotel, and I'd just be in my little place by myself, and the only people who were around were um, uh, railway workers. And in and, and White River, when the, when, the, when the trains come together, literally the entire hotel shakes. It's, a, it's the most intense thing. And, and that was what I did every day, sort of wait for that, you know, while I was doing this. I'm, I'm all over the place with that answer. Yeah, that's great. That's great. <laughs> Do you have another audience question? Or I can make Ed ask anyone? 
bargain at. We read in your bio, you went to law school. So you might be the first writer we've had in 40 years who has a law degree and you're a volunteer firefighter. <laughs> so kudos to you. But um, you mentioned that your dad was an attorney and I'm guessing that's where that came from. But, you know, legal writing is uh, its own little thing. Um, and the question comes up sometimes with writers, when did you want to be a writer? And if you want to be a writer when you were younger, what's up with law school? It's a good, great, great question, thank you. Uh, I come from like three, maybe, uh, three generations of Chicago lawyers. And uh, my father, on the contrary, tried to talk me out of this. He knew I was going to be a rotten lawyer. He knew this was a bad idea. And that's why I went. I actually rebelled by going. That was my, I mean, it's so stupid, right? And I was like, I'm going to, you know, I'm not doing what you do, which is he was a plaintiff's attorney and he defended insurance companies. I mean, that's, you know, why, I'm, why I went to college is on that, right? And so I said, I'm going to be a criminal defense attorney and I'm not going to work with you and da-da-da. Anyway, um, I actually loved law school and I, um, I loved that sort of, because it's all about stories. It's, you know, it's whose story's better? <laughs> who, can, who can tell it? And, and the stakes are, are higher than, than, than this, right? And so I really appreciated that. I don't appreciate the loans I'm still paying back. And I went to Northeastern Law School, which is the biggest pro bono program in the country. And I'm like, well, how come this isn't free then? But anyway, um, uh, and I, I teach law, I actually teach a class called Law and Literature. So I've, I've really enjoyed it. I think the world, uh, criminals uh, who need lawyers are a lot better off that I'm not out there doing it because I would have been distracted and writing stories about them and their, their experiences and not, and not defending them as well as I could. So, um, you know, but I, I've always been fascinated by, by the law and, uh, you know, it's something I'm, I'm sort of proud. I don't run from it, you know, I'm not one of those people because I never did it. So um, I, t I tried one case, one case, and I lost. It was an asylum case in San Francisco, and it was such a good case, and, and we lost, and it was heartbreaking. And I, I tell it in, in Underground America, the story of that, but um, it was an asylum case uh, from a, uh, a young guy from Guatemala who just, just horrific things had happened to him. And when I presented the asylum case, the, um, the judge in, in, in immigration law, you get an instantaneous decision. Like the, you, you try the case and then suddenly the judge leans in and says, you either get asylum or you don't. And this guy and I were sitting there and uh, uh, he, he, the judge denied, denied the case. I can't forget on what grounds. The prosecutor actually was kind of moved by it, by, <laughs> by the presentation and said, oh, you know, and I, I swear to this day I hear this in my, in my head and I do talk about this in an essay. He, uh, he said, you know, she said, well, you know, I just think she had too many Guatemalans today. You know, one too many Guatemalans today. That's what, that's what she said. And um, that was my experience in immigration law in San Francisco. So um, I don't know where I went with that, except that was my one case. He won on appeal, so he actually still, he, he does live in the United States now and did get asylum. So I wasn't maybe the bestest immigration lawyer either. <laughs> so um, it's all good. <laughs> Other audience questions? Oh, Chris. Uh, Ed mentioned uh, Voice of Witness. Could you talk a bit about that? Sure. Voice of Witness. Um, it, it's a. It's a. Started out as a, a nonprofit imprint of McSweeney's Publishing, um, and the uh, intent of it, and it still exists to this day, um, was to um, create books of oral history that that shed light on um, certain either a place in the world or a certain problem. Uh, and I, in 2008, when there was a lot of talk about immigration reform, um, you'll remember uh, George, what is he, H.W. or the, what is he? That one, the second one, uh, was actually um, pressing for immigration reform. There was, there was compromise in the air. Um, between the, the Gang of Eight, they called them, uh, Republicans and Democrats were coming together, and Bush was in favor of it, except he didn't have the guts to follow through on it. 
and he got hammered by talk radio and hammer and this is the rise of Rush Limbaugh and all of that and I um, I was curious because you know people have been talking about undocumented people in ways that I felt um, I felt like no one was actually I, I hadn't talked to them at least not enough right and so um, Voice of Witness allowed me to do this book where we went out and fanned across my students and I fanned out across the country and interviewed undocumented people and and, and demonstrate in the book that's right it's a book sitting right there um, that you know that our per that perceptions of undocumented people are ridiculous that, that undocumented people are as, as diverse and you know we had we had a millionaire in the book right a guy who did, owned cash machines and we had people who who crossed the border 18 times you know and we had people from Iran we had people from South Africa that when we talk about undocumented people it isn't what what is thought of Little did I know it would get, you know, intensely, insanely worse than, I, mean, I thought 2008 talk radio was bad, but anyway. So Voice of Witness does books like that, and they had the guts to um, do it, and Dave Eggers, who's, who founded it, um, founded Voice of Witness, you know, he is very creative, and he's willing to do stuff. Um, and, uh, and that, now there's about 25 books, um, ranging from Sudan to, we did a book on Haiti um, after the earthquake, and we also I also was involved with a book about Zimbabwe, which collapsed, um, as you know, a uh, sad case of Zimbabwe being a, a country that had so much hope. And so I wanted to know, like, why did a country that had so much going for it could feed its people, could educate its people, why did it um, fall apart? And so we told the story of that through interviews and making stories uh, out of the stories people that we interviewed, so, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I actually have a piece up on McSweeney's right now on the website um, in Haiti, and we're back there, uh, because Haiti's been having so much trouble now, and my friend who just got out of Haiti, um, we did, I did an interview with him in oral history, and he tells the story of what it's like to live um, on the streets of Haiti, streets of Port-au-Prince, um, in, in, you know, in a war zone, and um, it's pretty rough stuff, but uh, he's also a great storyteller, and focuses on the people and not just the problem. So yeah. that's the idea. I mean, I maybe just to follow up, I mean, can you, can you say a little bit about uh, the appeal to you of oral history? And I mean, I think, it, it, I imagine it has parts, it, it's partially to do with just the capturing those voices, but also partially to do with empowering people to, to tell their own story and share their own story and spread their own story. Yeah, I mean, it grew out of the legal question. I, you know, I wasn't going to be a good lawyer, but I could talk to people about political and legal and other kinds of problems, you know. And I realized that if, if I did one thing, it was storytelling. And I could, I could basically kind of provide a forum for other people to tell stories. And what I found, I mean, when I first started the immigration book, I talked to professors and other people, and they said, well, people are never going to talk to you. They're never going to open up to you. It's too dangerous or whatever. I found that I, could, I couldn't stop people from talking. Sometimes I had to say, look, look, you can't, like, you know, they'd, no, use my name. You know, fuck, it, it was like that. And I was like, no, 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 we got to protect you. And, and uh, so I find, and what I learned from that was everybody wants to tell their story. Everyone wants to tell a story. The question is, very few people are willing to listen. And the thing that I learned the hard way, because I like to get in there, I like to <laughs> I like chatter too, is, is just listen, listen. And I found that that's, that was the most respectful thing we could do. Um, and it wasn't, you know, kind of a, a quick thing. These were interviews that would last several days and, and follow up and, and still, um, to this day, I'm very close to uh, at least two narrators in, the, in Underground America. Uh, I mean, we have, we have, I want to make sure I leave time for people to have their books signed, but is, is there, if there's another question, we could take another question, or maybe we could hear the story about Muhammad Ali, if, if you're still willing to... Sure, sure, if people, I don't want to, I don't want to captive you here, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but it's, a, it's just two pages, so I could... Yeah, let's do that, and then let's okay. sign some books. Okay, great, great. Thank you, guys. Thanks for the questions, again, you know. Thank you, Ed. All right. All right. Uh
some reason I can't read sitting down. It makes me feel weird. But don't go anywhere. I, I mean, if you want to, I don't want to keep you up. Like, like you must working. stay and stare at me. No, it's like the worst, actually. <laughs> like to have to. But you can, you can. I'm gonna go. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Because now you can. Now your wine can, your mind can wander. You could check your, you know, check your messages. Um, anyway. So this is uh, uh, um, a chapter in this new book, um, and uh, it roughly goes chronological. So this is me, I forget what year um, it was, but um, maybe I was 11, 10, something along those lines. Even my grandmother, who appreciated the choreography of boxing, um, my grandmother was a, a professional dancer in Chicago in the 20s, Even my grandmother knew Ali couldn't beat Larry Holmes in 1980. He was too old, too slow. Ali in name only. The saddest thing were his legs, motionless as tree trunks. A man who used to dance and dance and dance. They say he needed the money. Blame Don King and his hair combed skyward. Couldn't Ali have done something else to raise the cash? I only wanted to it to be over. And when the bell rang to end the fourth just before the commercial break, Ali retreated to his corner, but he didn't slump down on his stool. It was like Holmes had jabbed him to sleep on his feet. He seemed to have no idea where the stool even was. Now, I wasn't the only kid who believed he was doing this for me. Sure, there was a fat check waiting for him, whatever happened, but he was sacrificing his body for me. I was a dumb Jewish kid in the suburbs, but I'd absorbed the Christ metaphor like everybody else. Sunk in the big black leather chair in the den, watching, not watching, trying not to watch, hands over my eyes, peeking between my fingers, Ali's cornerman pushing down by the shoulders to the stool, and just before the cut to commercial break, his face. More disinterest than weariness the kind of indifference that comes with being born, bone worn out. It was long past anything to do with physical tiredness. Round five, six, seven, eight, it no longer matters, and you'd think Holmes would start to take it a little easy. But Ali is making twice as much win or lose, and so Holmes has a point to make. Larry Holmes wasn't a great fighter, which captures the essence of a final truth. Eventually, mediocrity beats the shit out of everyone. Holmes was a workaday heavyweight who'd once been Ali's sparring partner, so there's poetry in it too. And Ali, of course, understood all this, given his genius for being all things to all people. The hired help is champion now, as it should be. I don't believe that Ali ever begrudged Holmes the beating. A dull fight, what I allowed myself to see of it. Ali held up his gloves to protect his face, and Holmes almost gently swatted them aside and clobbered with the same overhand right to the head again, again, and again. And then it became a thing. After every round, Ali would retreat to his corner, but he would not sit. It was as if to give in to his knees now would have meant remaining on that stool forever. His standing there was a lot worse than the fight itself. His cornerman shouting, cajoling, pleading, sit down, Mohammed, please, please. But he was no longer capable of hearing anything. And I could tell this from Chicago, alone in front of the TV in the den. There may have been other people in my house, but I was alone. And I wanted to whisper in his ear, Mr. Ali, even my own brother won't talk to me. And also, fuck Don King. The last thing I remember after they stopped the fight was that the ring was mobbed by all the people who loved Ali, including Larry Holmes. The victor struggled against the tide of bodies to get to Ali because even Holmes wanted desperately, beyond desperately, to confirm those wounds were real. <laughs>